thank you for coming to see me speak. This is the first time I've given a talk in Thailand. Um, I uh, have been to Thailand once before. Um, I spent many, uh, several weeks here about 30 years ago. Um, so that was a long time ago. Um, and I can't tell you whether Thailand has changed because all I've seen is a hotel, in the office, and this room, so who knows. But the traffic jams were just as bad 30 years ago. <laughs> Uh, so our purpose with XCONF is really part of our philosophy. Um, at ThoughtWorks we write software for our clients and we solve problems and we very much believe that we should share the results of what we learn. So as a result um, we do things like this and indeed all of my work, the writing that I do um, both for myself and uh, the way I work with my colleagues is all about this idea of sharing. And uh, if you, see, if you uh, go to my website, you'll see I have frequently articles available there. And this is all part of ThoughtWorks attitude that we want to share what we learn. So this talk, whenever I give a talk, I give talks all over the world, I always use this title because it can mean just about anything. Um, and I can therefore talk about different things without having to decide in advance. Um, and another thing I do when I do these talks is that rather than spend all 40 minutes giving you one long boring talk, I instead break it up into two short boring talks instead. <laughs> ah! Don't do that. Um, so the first of these talks is going to be on agile software development, uh, what I call essence and fluency. And this talk is really about um, concentrates on the fact that um, of when we started doing work with Agile Software Development uh, for Works back around 2000, um, it was not seen as a, a very effective way of doing software. It was very, um, very much a small fringe. <coughs> Since then, Agile Software Development has become a big thing, and you look around and everybody says they're doing it. But one of the problems with Agile with where we are at the moment with Agile software development is that a lot of people say they're doing it, but they don't really understand what it is. And so we see a lot of what I refer to as faux Agile. Faux meaning sort of false or fake, but it's a bit more of a fancy word than saying false or fake, so I like faux instead. Um, so this talk is about getting to that essence and explaining what Agile really is about, and also about something called fluency, which uh, we'll get to. So to understand where Agile comes from, we really have to come back to where software development was in the 1990s, uh, at, the time, at the time when many of this Agile thinking began. And we saw lots of projects with lots of problems. And this was recognized by the software industry. They talked about the software crisis all the time. And they felt they had a solution. And this solution was what we think of now as plan-driven processes. Um, and the idea of plan-driven processes is you have this very defined way of working, a um, very prescriptive approach. And that was seen as the future of software development and the way all software should be done. But although this was the majority view among serious people in the 90s, there was a bunch of people who thought differently. And those were the people of which a subset of them got together to write this manifesto for Agile Software Development. Um, I was fortunate enough to be one of the people who showed up at the meeting. Um, so I'm, I'm there too. And the way I looked at it, one of the kind of underpinnings to me with this was that I had had some experience with a particular approach called extreme programming. And I was interested in how it was similar to similar things um, that um, were many of the things talked about at this uh, workshop that came up with a manifesto, things like Scrum, feature-driven development, and the like. And a couple of years before the uh, manifesto came out, I wrote this article. Um, it's still on my website. And it tried to focus on what is the difference between that plan-driven view that was seen as the future in the 90s, and what we Agile people were thinking about. Um, it's still available um, on my website. 
And I really broke down this contrast. And I broke it down primarily into two main differences. One is the difference to do with planning, and the second to do with the attitude towards people and process. Let's start at the planning aspect of this first. So, in the plan-driven world, there's very much this separation between the act of planning and the actual execution. The idea is that you have, not just is it a different phase, but often done by different people. The um, inspiration for this comes from other forms of engineering, such as civil engineering or things of that kind, where you have a small group of the, the actual engineers who come up with the drawings and the plans, and then they hand them over to a separate group of people, the construction company, who builds the building. And this division between the plan and the execution was a very central part of how they felt software should be done. Now one of the aspects of this is that essentially what the plan is, it's a kind of a, it's a prediction of how the future is going to go. When you draw up that plan, both in terms of the various elements in the software and how they're going to fit together and work together, and the plan in terms of what order you're going to do things and who's going to do what, you are predicting how you think things should happen in the construction of the stage. And that affects the measure of success. In this world, success is when things go according to plan. Whenever you hear someone saying a particular project or an exercise was a successful project because it went according to plan, that's this plan-driven thinking, the predictive planning that's going on. Now, this has a problem with it. Having the, coming up with some plan like this requires you to know in advance what exactly it is you want to be built. Or what, in software terms, we talk about the requirements. You have to understand them, and they also have to be stable. They're not supposed to change. And that affects not just your planning, because the planning is so central to what you're doing, it affects the entire software development process itself. It requires you to have these stable requirements. And therein lies the question. And I ask um, audiences wherever I go, on the software project that you've been involved in in the last year or so, how many of you have seen significant changes of requirements during the course of the last year or so? Pretty much everybody sticks their hands up. We have requirements changing all the time. And this was recognized by the plan-driven community. And they said, oh, we need to do something about this. And so they came up with various techniques to try and stabilize it. And all these various techniques they advocated people using, but they never really managed to pin the requirements down and keep them stable. The agile attitude to this was to take a different point of view and say, well, we have this very awkward dependency between software development and requirement stability. What should we do about this? Well, maybe we should get rid of it. Get rid of that dependency. Assume that things are going to change, that requirements are going to change, and come up with a way of working that can work, indeed can flourish in that environment. What I have felt it was best summed up is, is this phrase from Mary Poppins. That's not just accepting change, it's saying we should take advantage of it, see there's a good thing. The um, subtitle of Kent Beck's book on extreme programming was Embrace Change. And that is that first distinction. In the plan-driven world, plans are predictive. We expect everything to plan things out and things go according to plan. In the agile world, we still make a plan, but we expect it to change all the time. And we manage that change, we take advantage of that change, and we come up with something better than was planned. The second shift has to do with the attitude of people and process. The plan-driven world is very much inspired by this gentleman, who you probably don't recognize, although you can tell he's in some kind of Victorian um, costume from the 19th century. But he's one of the most influential people in the world society. His name you probably haven't heard of, Frederick Winslow Taylor. 
Um, his influence is huge because he was the person who came up with much of the way of thinking that dominates industrial processes. His view was the average worker was too stupid or too venal to figure out how to do the work. So what you needed was a separate group of people who would plan how the work should be done to great detail. You know, they, if you were going to be shoveling some earth, they would decide the size of the shovel, how often you were supposed to shovel it, um, how long between you could take a break, what kind of person, how strong they should be to do the work. All of this would be best planned by these planners. And this dominated much of our industrial world really until the last 20 or 30 years and the rise of uh, um, things like uh, Kanban and the uh, more worker-centered approaches. Translated into software, this meant that when people talked about software processes, they always start with a list of things that need to be done and various dependencies and handoffs between them. They then say, we need some people. We don't really care the individuals, but we state what kind of roles they are. Programmer here, business analyst here, a tester here, project manager over here. And then when we want to run a project, we fit the people into the process that we have. The idea is that the process is independent of who actually does it. It will work the same way whatever the individual people are about. So no surprise, the Agile world questions that and says, well, did it ever really work like that? People are very different. Different kinds of software projects are very, very different. So as a result, it's hard to come up with some standard way of working across different project teams. And also, we don't necessarily assume that the workers are stupid and lazy, because these are very well-paid professional software developers. You can't write software if you're stupid. It takes a skill to be able to do this and an ability. And in that case, shouldn't the people who are actually doing the work, who are most knowledgeable about the circumstances, come up with their own process and way of working? So the Agile point of view is a much more um, group-centered thing. The idea is that every team should figure out its own way of working. Yes, you can take lessons from standard processes, and there are things in the Agile community like Scrum or Extreme Programming and the like, but they're very good sort of starting points, very good sources of inspiration. But in the end, it's the team that's in working in a particular circumstance that should decide how the work should be done. And they decide how to adapt things and how to change as things go on. Because the process you begin with isn't going to be the same process that, you, that you're running a year later. None of you are doing your job well. Because you should be reflecting upon how things are going and how things are working and changing your process according to that. So that summarizes what I see as the essence of Agile software development. A shift in how we think about plans and predictive to this adaptive style, and switching around so instead of a process first view of things, it's much more of a people first view. So that's the essence. Now I'll move on to the fluency. And the fluency is inspired by this article by Diana Larson and James Shaw, who are two of the early adopters and two really good thinkers about agile software development. And they observed that different teams who work in an agile way operate at what they refer to as different levels of fluency as to how they work. And typically, as teams are learning how to do agile development, they will progress to some degree through these stages, but also they need to keep an eye on what level and stage they want to achieve. And they came up with this thing called the Agile Fluency Model. I saw a, an early draft of the article and really liked it and offered to publish it on martinpower.com, my website. And they uh, went with that, and so you can find the article there today. And I'm going to explain the key concepts of it. And the key concepts really are, go, are focused on going through these levels. So the first level, which is called the focusing level, 
is where you're talking about the first zone, I should say. I should be very careful about not using the word level with this. First zone is where you're focused on producing business value. A lot of projects that in a non-agile world are about focusing, they focus on, have I done a particular task? It's very much task oriented. But one of the key things to learn about thinking in an agile point of view is to say, no, it's not the task that matters, it's the value that I produce. And so one of the first things that a good agile team will begin to do is to have this shift in focus, so that they're think, talking about business value. It usually takes a team a few months to get here, but the benefit of it is that you begin to have visibility into what's going on, in that the customers of the software begin to have a much more a sense of what's being produced and why it's useful. And also that you begin to see this ability to change direction that is so central to the planning, the adaptive planning side of um, software development. In order to do this, you need a bunch of practices that make this work. And the actual practices vary from team to team, uh, from approach to approach, but commonly you see people breaking things down into sprints or iterations, managing work with some kind of backlog or Kanban board, and particularly importantly, uh, one of the most important parts of this is that you have um, these retrospectives where you think about how things have gone, reflect on how things have gone, um, and um, you then um, adjust how you're working based on what you've learned. Now these management practices, these can definitely help. Switching over from this task-based view to a business value-based view can produce a lot better communication uh, and produce better things. But it doesn't really enable a team to really push forwards. Because in order to be able to get a little bit better, we need to think about the next step, the next zone in the fluency model, which is the delivering zone. And what happens here is we really take these management practices and we add in the technical practices that allow the code and the work products to be able to respond to this degree of change. Um, another way of thinking about it, somewhat biased because of my background, is it's changing from a scrum-only view of the world to an extreme programming view of the world. Because extreme programming, what I liked about it so much, is that it combined the technical and management parts uh, thinking together. So now we have new practices, such as test-driven development and continuous delivery and evolutionary architecture and refactoring. Things of this kind become part of the picture. Now, reaching the delivering, getting to a team where it can be fluent at the delivering zone takes a good bit longer than the focusing zone that I mentioned earlier on. It said uh, it can take, you know, maybe a few months, could even be a couple of years to reach this point. But the benefits are that you get uh, much more productivity within the development team. It can actually produce more value more quickly. And rather interestingly, you also get much lower defect rates. Uh, people often find this very surprising. They often say, well, agile software development is all is okay for things that don't need to work properly. You know, a website or something, where we can afford things to go wrong a lot. But actually, the good agile team will not have very many bugs. And we notice this very much when we go with our, go to our clients. When we first deliver our first projects, we are often operating at an order of magnitude less defects in production than is the common approach. And that is because of the disciplines required to operate quickly at this delivery level are the same disciplines that cause that defect rate to drop. Now in order to do this, you have to invest in learning these technical skills. And this is part of what makes the fluency model different to a maturity model. When you're thinking about adopting an agile approach, you have to decide early on what is the zone that you're aiming for. Are you aiming for just the focusing zone or for the delivering zone? You don't start by only looking at focusing and then moving and only looking at delivering. 
Um, you will do both. You'll probably get fluent to a focusing level first because it's a bit easier. But you have to aim um, and decide where you're going to aim to go. And you can be quite mature at a focusing level without necessarily being better than a team that is less mature at the delivery level. One of the key signs of the delivering teams is this phrase, ship up the market cadence. What that means is really the team software should be able to go into production at any time, whether or not it's intended or not. You don't think of it as being, um, you don't have some phase where you're trying to get it ready to be released. It's always in a releasable state. And at any time, a customer can say, take the software, put it into production now, even if you didn't plan for it, and the team would say, yep, that's fine. And that is because of the disciplines that come to, to do that. And it's the technical disciplines that make that work. So when we look at the way that causes, what you see is that to move to the focusing stage, the team has to shift in culture to have this focus on value. But to get into the delivering zone, you have to have a skills shift in order to be able to pull that off, those technical skills that I talked about earlier on. Now the next zone, is where a team can lead the market. And this is a shift in many ways of thinking of saying, you still, in the earlier zones, got this notion of you're doing things that a product manager or product owner tells you are the right things to build. When you move into this optimizing stage of leading the market, you move into the area where the team is deciding itself what are the features, how the software should evolve. This takes a good bit longer to reach. We're definitely talking years to reach this point. But the benefit is a great increase in the value of the, what's delivered. It puts you making better decisions about what to put into the product. But the investment is that the team now has to understand how the business works so that they can make these good decisions. It's also a broader shift because instead of just changing a single team, you have to change the broader organization itself. And that makes it much harder to achieve. I'm not going to say much about the fourth zone, because that's really the future of Agile, or at least how James and Diane see the particular future. Um, and so that's a much more speculative area. But we don't know how long it takes to reach this place, because we're not really sure what it is yet. This is an area of um, the model that's still um, in development. It's becoming a little bit clearer, but it's still not really solid yet. But for a final thought in this segment, I really want to point out that all of this probably, hopefully, sounds like hard work. Agile isn't easy. Um, people take it on and think, oh, we're going to wave some wand and make things better. No, it requires a lot of learning of skills, a lot of shift in organizational thinking, it's a big effort, and that's why it takes a long time to get to be reasonable fluent on it. I, I kind of therefore like to sum it up with a very experienced practitioner of Agile, um, Nigel Dalton, who has brought Agile thinking into organizations um, in Australia. Agile is not a pleasant ride, and I particularly appreciate this from my one time of riding on a camel um, in India many years ago. Not a pleasant experience. But on the other hand, if you want to get somewhere and through a difficult desert, it can be a good way of doing it. So that finishes the first talk. Uh, if you want more on this, I, uh, these are some suitable um, look things to look at the new methodology article, the Agile Fluency article, and older versions of this talk I've given uh, that are on my video page. So with that, we'll move into the second talk, which is flows in fairly well from what I was doing with the first talk. Because in the first talk, I talked about the fact that in order to get really productive in agile thinking, you have to take on technical practices, which allows you to get into this delivering zone of agile fluency. So in this talk segment, I'm going to really focus on how you do that. So. As often with these themes, I go back to the manifesto, 
and I look at the values section of the manifesto, uh, which is what a lot of people focus on. And I'm particularly going to focus here on this last section, the idea that responding to change um, is what's really important. We have plans, we come up with plans, but we always know that these plans are subject to constant shifting. That's the ability to respond. And this means that when we think of the features that we're trying to build, we need to have this responsive quality to them so that we can shift direction. Now, we have that hope that we can get there in the original focusing stage. We begin to see that we need to shift, but until we take on the skills that we need in the delivering zone, we can't actually make that shift. Now, there are various skills to put in. I'm just going to highlight what I can see, what I see as kind of the, the top um, list. Um, and this is the broad set that I'm going to talk through. I'll go through them one at a time. But before I go through them, I again want to acknowledge the point that I brought out earlier on. If you're at all familiar with agile software development, you may be recognizing a lot of these things. And that's because these are the things that were described some 20 odd years ago by Kent Beck in the original Extreme Programming book. Um, I often feel that most of my life is really spent taking other people's ideas and repackaging them, and hopefully explaining them a little bit more clearly to everybody else. And that's what I'm doing here. Um, although it's hard to beat how well Kent explains things, I do my best. So, we talk about responsive features. I like to go, uh, if you, and this is, uh, the first thing here is one of the most um, difficult things for many people to get hold of, and that is that the central importance of what I've referred to as the internal quality of a code base, being able to do this. If you have a code base that has a lot of unnecessary complexity, or as we, the term that we tend to use, cruft in the code base, it just makes it harder to change things. Um, how many people here uh, have worked on a software project that, where you seem to get slower and slower over time because it gets harder and harder to change things because the code seems, the old code, the legacy code seems to be slowing you down? How many people have experienced that? Pretty much everyone. But it doesn't have to be that way. Sometimes you can build a code base which is doesn't even have that, not have that slowing down effect, but where you can actually feel a sense of speeding up, where you need, when you build a new feature, you can take existing parts of the code, take the them, put them together in a slightly different way, you know, modify a little bit here and there, and actually feel like your existing code base is accelerating you. How many people have had a project like that in their experience? One or two, not many, but one or two. It is possible, it can be done, and this is this thing that I call internal quality. This ability to make the code base be responsive to your changes, not slowing you down. So how do we get this internal quality? Well, one element that is really important is something that I refer to as self-testing code. And this is an idea that really went to the heart of pushing against this plan-driven mindset uh, when we started it here. Because in the 90s, we were always told that you know, a, a software developer should never write tests for their own code. In fact, a software development team shouldn't write tests. There should be a separate testing team in a separate part of the building, or often on a separate continent that would write the tests. And they would never talk to each other. In extreme programming, can change this around. And said, well, instead, every time you write a piece of a feature, you write a test that tests that feature. And you're not done writing the feature unless you've also got a set of automated tests to test the feature. And over time, you'll create a whole bunch of these features and a whole bunch of these tests. And at any time, you can run all of these tests with a single command or a single push button on your user interface, and it will come back either green or red. Green saying all the tests pass, red saying that something has failed. And you know you've got a good test suite when you're confident that you can make any change in your code, and if you make a mistake and break something, 
tests. One of those tests will fail. And this is useful on an individual level, and even more useful, of course, at a team level. But it's something that I find incredibly useful individually with my things I'm doing, because I make mistakes all the time. And that I need some way of detecting when I make a mistake. So writing the tests is effectively writing a bug detection system. And this importance with quality, then, immediately is, well, this is, of course, one of the reasons why a lot of agile projects that are done with that delivering fluency don't produce so many bugs. It's because they put a lot of attention into things like this automated testing, to, which drops the bug rate significantly. And that's obviously a valuable source of quality, because now, instead of having this legacy code, I may do something and I don't realize I've broken something and I don't find out until it's in production, I get this alert much more quickly. And I'm able to fix things quickly because I've only just done a small thing. I will run tests very, very frequently. Now, often every time I compile, I'll then immediately run tests. So if one breaks, I've only done a few minutes work between when it broke and when it was working. And because there's only a small amount of work between those two things, I can quickly see what the problem is and fix it. If, on the other hand, I wait days or weeks or months before running tests and something breaks, then I've got a huge amount of work to find out where the breakage is. So frequent tests run very frequently is the key to self-testing code. Now that improves my ability to change things directly, but it also has a very important secondary effect, is it enables the next technique, which is refactoring. Now you may know that refactoring is something very close to my heart. Um, I wrote a book, whole book on refactoring. In fact, I wrote, liked it so much I wrote the whole book twice. <laughs> refactoring is all about this ability to look at a problem in the code base, something as simple as a function has a, a name that's hard to understand, and say, we shouldn't let these difficulties, these little pieces of craft, um, fester and get things worse. So when I see something that's bad like that, I want the ability to be able to take a look at it and change it and make something that's more sensible. Of course, if I change the name of a function, I also have to go and change all the places that call the function. But if I do that change of a name, package it all up into one step. One of the nice things about it is that I've not changed the way the overall program works. I can take the tests and I can run them and they will stay green. The thing about uh, refactoring is that it doesn't change the way the overall program works. And if I do a small refactoring, I can make this change and I'm not likely to break anything. And should I break anything, the tests will tell me now, changing one function name and all its callers may not seem like a very big deal. Indeed, one of the things I say about refactoring is that every refactoring is really too small to be worth doing. But the key is that refactorings compose really well. I change one function over here, change one function over there, change a variable, move a function from one place to another place in the code base. Every step, tiny step, and after each step, I test, I commit to my local repository, step, and I go through this step. And over the course of a few hours, I can make actually quite a big change. And I do that all without breaking anything. And the tests underpin that, they should detect if I break anything. So with refactoring and self-testing code in play, now I can I'm no longer hampered by a code base that's got a lot of cruft in it, because when I see cruft, I can remove it. And now I'm able to make the code base better. And this is important because I make mistakes. I make mistakes in how I lay things out. I make mistakes because I can't predict what new features will come. But if I can always refactor the code, then I can react to that, and I can keep the code base much more healthy. Then on top of that, I then have to then concern myself with, that works well for me, but how does it work in the context of a team? If I'm refactoring the code, 
Is that going to break somebody else's work? Now we introduce a practice called continuous integration. So continuous integration is probably one of the most controversial things that I'm putting up here. I mean, there were times when self-testing code and refactoring was controversial, but these days continuous integration is quite controversial. Um, let me explain exactly what that is. So the way a lot of people collaborate across teams is that they use feature branches. Essentially, everybody who's building a feature will take a, their own copy of the code, controlled by version control system, and they will work on their individual feature for a period of time. It could be hours, it could be days, it could be weeks, I've even seen months. And everybody feels everything's fine. Because at regular intervals, what people do is they, they uh, take the um, changes that have occurred on that main line part of the code, the shared area of the code, and they incorporate them back into the, uh, their individual branch. And that all works fairly well. And in this case, when the purple one finishes, it can finish by saying, oh, I'm in sync with the main line, I can just make that change, and it all goes well. But the problem is, although the purple and the green branches have been following what's going on on the main line, they haven't been coordinating with each other. So when the green branch has to go into the main line, it has to merge all its work with all the purple work that has occurred. And that is a big and complicated and somewhat scary merge. Now the contrast is continuous integration. With continuous integration, what happens is that not just do we pull down from mainline all the changes that might occur to mainline, we also take every little change we make and we push it back to the mainline as well. The rule of thumb in continuous integration is that you should be pushing to mainline at least once a day. Everybody should be pushing to mainline at least once a day. There is a bit of an overlap with feature branches. If your feature branches are less than a day in length, then it's the same thing as continuous integration. Most feature branches run longer than that, which is why we make this distinction. But continuous integration is all about this push back and forth. So as a result, what you see is there's a lot more pushes and pulls going on. A hell of a lot more. But notice at the end, there is no big emerge. And that's because by doing this integration all the time, we make them all little integrations and we avoid the big one. And that is important because the big one is often fraught and difficult um, and hard to do. But the real advantage, the real distinction between these two is in the context of refactoring. Let's imagine in a feature branch world, the purple and the green, they do incompatible refactorings. I change a function over here to one name, green goes over and changes its same function to a different name. And then we make use of the function that we've called. When do we detect that we've made this incompatible change? Well, we don't detect it until that final merge. And that's, of course, why those final merges tend to be so scary. And if you've made incompatible changes like this due to refactoring, there's usually a lot of pulling of hair, a lot of problems, and what people learn to do is to not refactor because they don't want to get into this kind of mess again. In the continuous integration, we make that same incompatible change. When do we find out we've got an issue? We find out really much right away. We'll find out within a day because everybody's pushing and pulling within a day. And that means that refactoring is no longer a scary thing to do in a team. Because if we do something, if we make some incompatible refactoring, we find out quickly, we can have a conversation, we can figure out how to fix it. And that's why continuous integration was so much a part of extreme programming. Now, I don't want to say that feature branching is always a bad thing. There are some advantages with feature branching. Um, there is trade-offs involved. And there is different circumstances where you might want to use one or the other. Feature branching really became popular in the open source world. In the open source world, you tend to have sporadic contributions 
and also a low level of trust because people are out there just making a change and then sending a patch to you. You don't really know what quality the patch is, whether it's something you can accept or not. And in an open source world, getting everybody to do their work on feature branches and then reviewing the changes as they come back, that makes sense. But when you've got a full-time team of people who are working closely together, a different approach is, uh, it makes sense. And this is again one of the, the precepts behind agile thinking. You should pick your process according to your circumstances. Don't use a technique that's designed for a different set of conditions in your context if they don't match up. And so that's why uh, we tend to, uh, I, I and many of my, most of my colleagues at Forwards, are strong advocates of continuous integration. And continuous integration is essential, as I said, for refactoring. Because you can't refactor effectively in a team environment if you're not doing continuous integration. But also continuous integration relies on having self-testing code. Because without self-testing code, you don't find those incompatible breaks. I mean, you can find changing the name of the function. This little merge tool will figure that out for you. But a lot of the more complicated things are semantic changes. And only tests to discover those. So we have continuous integration. We have self-testing code. We have refactoring. This brings us to a technique called Yagnin. And if uh, I, I take it most of your most of you are English is not your first language, so you might be wondering what this word Yagni means. Don't worry, it's not really an English word anyway. Um, let me explain where it, what it is and where it comes from. So. Um, when we started doing this kind of design, uh, kind of work, design work, we always said that we should design in order to build features in a, a, for coming up in the future. We should build a design now that's going to be effective for future change in the system. And what Yandy does is it questions that and says, no. The phrase that Kent used back in the very first extreme programming was, those future features, you aren't going to need it. And it's Yagnin. It's, it's originally an acronym, but it's really ten, turned into its own word. Now, the idea then is that we never build anything other than what we immediately know to be useful. Why is this? Well, there's for various reasons, um, but particularly a reason that we do this is because of the fact that if we don't, if the features in the future are going to change anyway, if we build a feature that we end up not using, it's just wasted work. And what's more, it takes time away from a more high priority feature that we want to do earlier on. And what's more, if we put unnecessary features, in, uh, capabilities into the code to support features we don't actually need, that adds craft to the code base, makes it harder to understand and slows us down. So with Yagni, you end up with a much more limited set uh, of things. Now, Yagni as an approach is not something that's a good idea. In fact, it's a very stupid idea to do if you're not using the other practices I talked about earlier on. If you aren't refactoring, and you, therefore you can't change the code easily, if you haven't got to test and determine problems, then Yagni is not a viable approach to use. But once you have the enemy, once you have these things in place, then you can get away with that. And it's self-reinforcing. Because by never putting more stuff into the code base than it needs to be for the features you have, you keep the code less complex, and therefore you're able to uh, support doing more of the same thing. So that's internal quality, which is really at the heart of getting to responsive features. But there's a little gap here. And that's to bring up the second thing that's very important, which is continuous delivery, which is an offshoot from what continuous integration does. Continuous integration is about getting a team to um, work within, um, to co coordinate within the development environment. Continuous delivery is all about taking that and taking it through to production, typically by use of some kind of deployment pipeline by which every change that an individual makes goes through a series of more complex tests until it's actually pushed out into production. And indeed, even tested in production. 
and with some kind of test and QA process on the production side of things. Now, continuous delivery um, is a particular focus of uh, this excellent um, book, Accelerate, which was the best book um, in software development written last year, which I say with a heavy heart because my refactoring book was written last year, um, but mine can only be second best. Um, Nicole Forsgren and her colleagues, what they did was they looked at various techniques around software development, um, and they were able to classify teams depending upon whether they were high, medium, or low performance. And in, it should not perhaps surprise you that much, considering many of the things I've said, is that high-performing teams tend to deploy many, very frequently, many times a day. The lead time between getting code committed into your repository and getting it in production is very short. And so we get that rapid response, the responsive environment that I talked about earlier on. Notice, however, particularly important, is this fact that the change failure rate of high performers is significantly lower than that for the, for the lower performers. And that, I think, is a particularly important point. And again, reinforces that fact that using these techniques gives you a low amount of bugs as well as the responsiveness. Indeed, the low amount of bugs is necessary for the responsiveness that I talked about earlier on. I'm not going to say this is a complete list of all the things you need to do. Um, I mean, there are certainly many other issues, things that are very handy. Pair programming is a very useful technique. It's uh, we use a great deal. Knowing how to migrate databases is very essential. There's plenty of technical skills out there. But I think this represents a particularly important set of them. Um, and are the ones that um, I like to focus on when I'm talking about this. As well as explaining really how they fit into the general picture of uh, where refactoring fits into the broader picture of software development. And so that's me out of time. And I uh, hope you found it useful. Thank you.